Du sollst ja vielleicht auch nicht mehr erleben lassen. Aber wir erleben doch gerade alles da. Bald wird er den Zuschluss noch schließen. Zahllose winzige Lichter leuchtet wie in einer Tonne von Monster. Rosa gab es zwölf. Wir machen zwei, sollen wir machen. Der Klettkotterblock ist in Leipzig bei der Leipziger Buchmesse und jetzt treffen wir im Hotel David Whitehouse. Also neben mir sitzt David Whitehouse. It's nice to meet you here in the hotel. You have written a book which had been published by Tropen with a German title Die Reise mit der gestohlenen Bibliothek. It's a journey with a stolen mobile library. And what is the content of your novel? It is, um, it is a story of a, a young boy named Bobby Nushku, who his uh, life is terrible, his father beats him, he's bullied at school, um, he has very few friends, and he finds friendship in an unlikely place with a, um, with a 40 year old woman who lives down the road from him, um, and her daughter who is disabled, and their life is terrible too, and they, they what they have in common is that they're lonely and they need togetherness and they need family and uh, they need love and um, they escape together in a mobile library which takes them on a journey um, down the court. The, the no mobile library not be, be, does not belong to them. The mobile library doesn't belong to them. No, the the woman he befriends, her name is Val, and she is the cleaner in the, in the mobile library. Uh, so she has the keys, and they escape. They elope. And she has never never conducted the library. No, no, she steals it. Yeah, they they um, it's a it's a huge. When I say mobile library, it's like the ones I remember from my childhood. So it's a huge. It's the biggest truck on the road, um, and she steals it. They're so kind of desperate for freedom and escapism that she um, she takes it yeah. but we have to note that there is obviously an interference very strong between the stories of your novel and the books in the library yeah well the the, the books in the library that they read on their journey uh, represented for me the the ways books can help us escape. So what they're doing, when you first meet Bobby at the beginning of the story, he hasn't read an awful lot and his life is terrible and what he needs is escapism and he kind of finds that in the in the books in the library and they become windows, if you like, on different worlds, which are what books are. Uh, and they help him to expand his horizons, expand his imagination and he finds that his life starts to reflect a few of the stories that he reads or vice versa you know are imitating life you can nearly say that the books which Bobby is reading shows him the real world yeah absolutely they show him they show him new roads that were close yeah. to him before yes. yeah a mobile library is fascinating because the movement reflects in a certain sense the movement of the stories in the books and the books takes us every day to another place and this does the mobile library also is this a reason for you to have sh chosen chosen the bus um, uh, the reason I chose the bus, I think, is, is that, and also because uh, I'm a little bit obsessed with them. My, when I was a young boy, uh, my mother was the cleaner in a mobile library, so as is Val in the book. But uh, you're, you're not Bobby. I'm not Bobby, but, uh, <laughs> but every weekend we had the keys, um, me and my brother and my sister, to the mobile library. So we used to sit in it every weekend, we used to take the books, read the books, hang, just play, just play there really. Um, and it was always a beautiful thing when you're a little boy it's amazing to have you know you're obsessed with trucks and trains and big things you know but when, when you was young you, you you dreamt not about um the fact that your mother will take the keys uh, the bus it would have been good <laughs> I, I'd, have, I'd have liked it but we, ne we never got to drive it i don't think we had the keys to the to the to the uh, ignition but the in every book you find advices for your own life. Rose explains to Bobby all stories are linked together. You awake them to life when you read them and you will live yourself what you read. What you read. Is it your intention to show how literature works? You could say that your book is an instruction for lecture. Yeah, I think it, it is my intention. It's my intention to recreate the feeling of uh, discovering literature and 
particularly specifically how that made you feel when you were young, when you were a child, you know, and you first discovered literature, and how it develops and grows, and how it gives you, um, how it can give you. Well, it's important because it can give you different perspectives on your own life. So in the book, their life is sad and difficult, and when they when they read some of the novels in the library, some of the classics and 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 whatnot, it expands their horizons and it helps them. You know, helps them grow. I think. But there was first an intention to explain how literature works, or first the idea to write this novel. What was first? Um, what came first? I think the yeah, it was the the intention to explain how literature works. The idea, that idea, came before the story. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, Yes, that's the kind of way around it came, but then they came, became tangled together and they kind of worked, hopefully they worked together. Um, one page later you tell us that Bobby wishes to become a part of the book he was reading, he wants to live an adventure. This, yeah. this, this was... That's about um, escapism, when you're young and you imagine that your life is boring and difficult. Um, you don't imagine that your story could be anything as exciting as, as what happens in a book. But the story of a, a boy becoming a man, uh, the story of a life is as exciting as is any novel. The, you're going to fall in love, you'll experience grief, heartache, all of these things. And But Bobby's options are so closed when he's young that he doesn't understand that his life could be anything like what would happen in a book. But of course, it actually his life is a book and he doesn't understand that until he reads the reads the books in the library. You remember your, the, the first books you have read? Yeah, yeah, very vividly. Um, uh, the first proper books that I read were books uh, Roald Dahl, um, I was obsessed with, uh, still am. I read them all the time. I steal a lot of his ideas. Um, a book, an Australian author called Paul Jennings um, wrote very strange stories for a bit like Roald Dahl's stories for adults as well, Tales of the Unexpected. Paul Jennings writes stories like that for children, very weird, very dark, uh, and I loved, I loved all of those things, yeah. Um, Bobby create in his head an exactly map of the locations where he, live, where he lives. The, this creates certainty, and the certainty is also the hope that his mother, who died in an accident, will come back. Yeah. This is a fiction in the fiction? It is, a, it is a fiction in the fiction, but it's how it's about how a child uh, copes with grief because uh, his mother isn't isn't around in the book, and he's not willing to accept that she might not be coming back. So it's about how a child internalizes, uh, creates a narrative in himself, a fiction within a fiction, mm -hmm. to cope with grief and loss, um, which is something Roald Dahl did a lot. If you if you read James and the Giant Peach by Roald Dahl. Uh, that's about a little boy coming to terms with the death of his parents um, by talking to insects in the garden. Uh, and I was trying to recreate that childish, uh, childlike reaction to loss. Yeah. And he's also creating an archive about the things who belongs to his mother. He's creating a, uh, it is an archive, it's a museum to uh, remember his mother by because the memories of a child are so vague anyway and they're not always correct and he's creating a narrative about his mother who isn't around anymore that he might not remember so it's a it's kind of a strange dark story that he's trying to tell I think. But Bobby has also a bad character the story with a methylated spirit and the attack on, the, on his classmates even when he wants to take revenge because they have attacked the daughter Rose of Vell is not acceptable I think. Yeah. I know he has a difficult childhood, an impossible family, but all this does not justify to verse methylated spirit in the eyes of his classmates. Why, why he did this? He's, um, I think at this point Bobby is He's dealing with the grief of the loss of his mother, he's dealing with having no friends and his father in a terrible life and he's driven to Uh, he's desperate and he's driven to extremes and he's not he's almost not in control of his actions so in the book he um, he imagines it like it's in a storybook to kind of a little bit of a, to trick himself escapism to explain his behavior yes his behavior is wrong he shouldn't do it but des desperate times on page 114 of the German translation you precise the instruction to read and you quote Roald Dahl's novel Matilda. 
After this, his lecture, Bobby observes an apple and, wa and waits until the apple will transform him itself. The lecture of books gives objects a real life and that is what you want to explain to your reader. Yeah, again that's um, is the, the, the books he's reading expanding his imagination, imagining himself being able to do impossible things. So they're giving him hope where there was no hope before, which is what books should do for children, um, which is why they're important. So the, the example of Matilda is he's trying to move the apple uh, with his eyes like Matilda does in the book. And um, obviously it doesn't happen, but it's about him discovering a sense of belief, I think. I think this passage is very important for your book because here you can explain how imagination works, how, how it works to think about objects and how the thinking about objects can be influenced by literature. This is the point. Yeah, absolutely. That is exactly my point. It's, um, it's a, how it changes your perspective. Before he read Matilda, he would never have done that. He'd never have imagined that he might be able to do that, even though he can't do that. It's impossible. But the idea that he could imagine that, you know, it expanded his horizons. Yeah. In other words, reading makes us much more sensitive for an environment, for our environment, and for the objects around us. We does not wonder if they would start her own life. Yeah, does, um, re the reading does make us more sensitive to the objects around us, makes us more sensitive to people as well and relationships um, and location and space, uh, everything. It's that it gives us, we can only live one life, but through a book, through a story, you can live hundreds of others simultaneously. So that's what and that's what's happening to Bobby. He didn't see that before. He did, that wasn't a part of him. Um, to read us this book asks Bobby Tobal and gives her the great voluminous book of Moby Dick, yeah. of Melville, a very used book. The lecture follows a paragraph where Bobby observes once the doors of the bus were closed, the bookshelves, the books, as opportunities to escape, to leave reality. Yeah, absolutely. Every everything, every book he reads becomes a part of his own story really. So Moby Dick in the book uh, was the idea that the mobile library is is a whale and he's he's trapped inside the whale as in Moby Dick um, and, then, and then later of course when the mobile library goes towards the sea that all becomes to make sense. Every story referenced in the book, every piece of literature referenced in, Mo in, in the book is um, comes true in a way in his head because he because he's able now to imagine yeah with four beams dipped to oncoming traffic the mobile library snaked slowly down the lanes that sliced the country in two joe drove he had barely spoken since the incident in the woods you're a professional Faust said of his driving my other car's a tank he said She let her hands settle on his thigh. The lean, solid muscle dried her mouth instantly, reducing her voice to a squeak. <coughs> Joe relaxed and pondered his tremendous good fortune, but a tightening in his lower back made him wonder if it could last. Rosa rested her head on Bobby's shoulder, and he read to her, Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Rosa squawked at every appearance of the parrot, Flint, who always perched on Long John Silver's shoulder and shrieked as Flint's pirate master revealed his ruthless, violent side, murdering a member of the crew as part of his plan to escape with the treasure. Do only bad people have parrots? Rosa asked. Bobby thought about it. The stiff beak, the beady eye, hooked nail claws for tearing the skin. Probably, he said. Then why don't they fly away? I don't know, Bobby said. I don't know. And together they sang that old sea song. Fifteen men on the dead men's chest, a yo-ho-ho -ho and a bottle of rum. And he read to her until they reached the light strip of the, of the autobahn, where the cars sped small around them, fish swimming in the slipstream of a shark. Before midday, Joe turned the mobile library into a service station forecourt and parked in the area reserved for long-haul vehicles. And when he switched off the engine, There was an abruptness to the way that the silence arrived.
tired, of, tired looking men came and went, but despite the days and weeks of radio news coverage, and the number of times they'd heard their names as they'd retuned for a traffic update, none of those men suspected that the most sought after vehicle in Britain was the one that they had pulled up next to. Or that in the back was the infamous Joseph Sebastian Wiles, with Rosa sleeping beside him as she now insisted on doing. And he didn't mind. In fact, he adored the way that she used his arm as a pillow, and he didn't even move it when it went dead. Morning, afternoon, evening and night became vague terms for how light the sky was and nothing more. They slept when they could and they drove when they couldn't, never staying in a single place long enough for anyone to get more than one look at them. They cooked back and forth across the country, detouring to avoid towns, taking any minor road that the mobile library would fit down and trying some that it resolutely wouldn't. Joe made Val cut her bank cards in half with his knife and they spent what remained of the cash as slowly as possible. And they split into twos, mother and son, father and daughter, and they bought provisions from rural mini-markets. Roadside vendors sold them freshly picked fruit and vegetables. Farm shops filled plastic tubs with cheaply priced milk. And when the sun was high enough, they stopped in fields to eat and rest, and picked spiky yellow seed pods from the fur on the dog's back. They played cards and built half-finished dens that they knew they'd abandon. Joe kept the truck in order, Val made the meals, Rosa tidied the books away, and Bobby fetched clean water from streams in a rusted tin bucket. They moved by night. Every day had a different view. Cloud-fronged cloud snow peaks on mountains in the north, valleys in the west, green, lush, wet with mist, locks stiller than death, and entire meadows that bowed to the wind. Bobby read voraciously. He consumed sacks of classic books that Val had recommended, and he discovered new books for himself based on little more than a feeling he got when he held them and read the back cover. It was an itch that would not abate until it had been scratched. And Rosa listened. And as Bobby gave voices to the characters in the books, she found that a hundred friends lived inside her greatest friend of all. Did you first create the characters and then the story or have you an idea of the novel and then you have created the characters? Of I think the, uh, the characters came first because they're, char they're, cut, they're stolen from my real life parts of them they're, and they're patched together um, into, into kind of new characters but the characters came first and I always knew this would be a story about a little boy and a woman who escaped together in a library. I always, that was always the, the case, the characters. But the story, everything else came afterwards. Joe and the, the actual journey, I, w I went along with them. So I just knew that they'd drive away. But at the point in the book when they drive away, I didn't know what was going to happen to them. Because mm -hmm. it was important that I went on a journey with them. Who should read your book? Uh, everybody. <laughs> um, I think it's, a, it's difficult. I'd like... It, Anyone with a uh, love of story, hopefully. Um, I think it's a it's an adult book. It's very dark at points, um, but it's dealing with darkness and real themes through the eyes of a child, um, which is what I want it to be a children's book for adults. Uh, I want it to give you that feeling of first discovering literature and stories. Uh, that's one layer of it, and then with the story on top. Um, so yes, it's for adults. It's also a book who can be read by people to young people. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, because the um, as in as in great children's literature, I hope the darkness is hidden behind, um, hidden under something new. So, like you said earlier, there's these layers, and um, I think it works on one level as a story about a boy running away with with a woman and discovering books and having an adventure um, to mask the darkness behind it and. So yes, I think it can be read to children, maybe slightly older children. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was, that was fun. Thank you.